from CBS News headquarters in New York. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her doctor, not the government. Thus, the anti-abortion laws of 46 states were rendered unconstitutional. We had gotten the Time Star, the afternoon Time Star, and I saw on there that that was passed. And I, I could still want to cry over that. During the year that I was doing my fellowship, they asked us to do some projects, so I organized a two-day conference on the theme of beginnings of personhood. And we were having that conference when Roe v. Wade happened. If I had been better equipped, and I could have maybe found the text of Roe v. Wade. But in my memory, I remember them talking about potential human life. And to me, that sounded so weird. Potential human life. Can you kill a potential human life? Think back to those times of the mm -hmm. culture, well, socially, mm -hmm. politically, what was happening? I graduated from nurses training in 1968. In 68, an abortionist was arrested for murder. Well, wow. how can from one year it be murder and arrest to the next year it's taking care of the mother and eliminating her problem? The mindset of the people at that time was that, oh, this couldn't possibly happen. You know, this is, this back in the 70s and before, you know, you talk to your friends and that, they, you know, nobody could envision what was going to happen. It was sort of a shock. January 22nd happens to be the very same day that President Lyndon Johnson, ex-President Lyndon Johnson, had died. So when the Supreme Court decision came, the headlines were about him, about the president not about the Supreme Court decision, so it didn't get the play that you would have thought. People didn't see the, 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 the range of that decision. You know, court decisions are a dime a dozen, but some of them are, are life-changing for the church or for the world, and, and this one was life-changing, and some people didn't realize that until it began to be publicized, and, uh, and of course, then the pro-life people began to speak up. I saw something in, in the Wilkie's book that on the day of the decision, Jack Wilkie spoke at 14 radio and television stations all in that one day because it, it burst across the country. On January 22nd, uh, we had uh, a Right to Life meeting planned for downtown at St. Xavier Church. And he would stay home with the kids when I would go to Right to Life meeting. So I went down there and everybody was there and Dr. Wilkie walks in and he says, well, it's all over everybody. Should we just go home and just forget about it? The fight's all over. What do you say? And everybody's you know, mad like he says. And everybody goes, no, we're not going to quit. I think Dr. Wilkie is a hero. He really um, gave up a very lucrative medical career to follow his heart and follow his conscience. He saw that um, there was a need for someone to step to the forefront of the pro-life movement. And while there were a lot of foot soldiers, there weren't too many people who wanted to be general, and he saw that that was definitely a need. What kind of person was Dr. Wilkie as the head of society? Well, like I say, he, I had heard him speak, not on right to life or anything. Yeah. I just heard him speak, and I was impressed. And then when I read about Dr. Wilkie, you, you know, starting this right to life and everything, I, I just thought I gotta join him. Yeah. Yeah. You are the reason why uh, the abortion will end, and it will end here on our watch. Doctor. Dr. Felix Cowan, who was president of Vermont Right to Life at the time, um, said he had heard that I had moved to Cincinnati, and I said yes, and he said, you are so lucky. He said, that is where pro-life things are happening. That's the center of the Right to Life. That's the center of everything that's happening in the pro-life movement. Right to Life was primarily education and legislation. So we were lobbying and we were educating. And the big thing, the big challenge for us was to keep the issue alive because so many times when a Supreme Court decision comes down, it's settled. It's settled, you know, and within a matter of months, everybody forgets it, they go home and, and they, they accept it. And so the big challenge was, how are you gonna keep the issue alive? 
are complaining about what what's being done. We're not. What are we doing about it? And we decided we'd like to find out about that. There was a man by the name of Bob Pearson. Pearson had the novel idea. I don't know if he came from there, but he was in Hawaii, and Hawaii had a three-day waiting period. If you wanted an abortion, you had to wait three days. So what he figured out was these girls would fly from the mainland, come over there to get the abortion, and they had to wait three days, so he said, come and stay with me. Then you don't have to pay for a hotel. So that's how he ended up getting girls to come. He had a chance to talk to them and persuade them. And that's when he came up with the idea. If we had centers like this, the girls could come and they could get some help. Jackie went to train with Bob Pearson, and the thing that impressed me when she talked about it was that he would open his centers close to Planned Parenthood and um, sometimes in office buildings where Planned Parenthood had a center and as uh, young women would be coming in he or someone would divert them <laughs> into his center. The concept on the surface was wonderful. There were a few things that I didn't like about it that I thought wouldn't work. So we came back and discussed what we felt would be okay. Next thing you know, we are moving forward. I had my friends and family and a handful of other people. Barb Seeger went with me to Little Rock and she had a friend who had a building across from Planned Parenthood. They used to be on Glenway, right before Carson School. And there was like a little bowling alley room that he was willing to give us. We had no money. It was just a little shacky building. <laughs> We had like three rooms. Yeah. It was very small. I yeah. remember working there with, with Mrs. Corey and yeah. we were butt to butt, back to back, <laughs> a little tangled space, a little... doing pregnancy tests and picking people in. See that, yes. the it first... was tight. It, it was... was really tight. It's right near Seton and Elder, how, oh, yeah. but, that, but the reason it was chosen was because it was across the street from Planned Parenthood. It was probably going to be about $1,100 to turn little rooms in this bowling alley, okay? And we were exhausted from being there cleaning and just, you know, tidying things up. I got in the shower and Mike knocked on the door, my husband, and said, there's some little guy out there that says he has something for the pregnancy center. And I said, oh, Mike, well, take it from him. You know what I mean? I just got home, take it from him. And he said, well, it's a truckload. And I thought, oh, no furniture. I mean, what are we talking about? So I threw my clothes on. We went up to the center, unlocked the door, helped him carry everything in, and he was gone, absolutely gone. Little white truck, little man. And I said to Mike, and that was a little strange. So Mr. Holman got there the next day, and he said, this was everything on the list. So we thought the KFC did it. You know what I mean? We thought the KFC did it. Got all the guys at KFC. Wasn't them. Wasn't any of our husbands. You know what I mean? And it just, we figured it was St. Joseph. <laughs> to this day. It's yes. Right. Yes, it is. We never found out. The Knights of Columbus helped to actually do the work and prepare this little place that we could actually use it. So Right to Life provided the materials, the Knights helped with the labor, and the Right to Life people from all the parishes, we said, can you do it? And most of us said, what do you mean? Do pregnancy tests? <laughs> Counsel? I don't have a background part. in that. Counseling's the hard part. <laughs> I said, I'll do the part that I can do for my kitchen, which was talk to people on the phone She's and make up schedules and make up lists of people who might be volunteering. And I'll come in and volunteer as a counselor, but only, you know, several times a month. She because was always I, on the phone, never off the phone. I really was. Yes. <laughs> Drive me crazy. <laughs> How did you get the word out about the pregnancy center? Sometimes I don't have any idea. When I look back, I think, oh, we got to, we try to spread this through the churches and everything. And I think, where did these clients come from? I expected, you know, maybe one or two drifting in here. Right away, from the very beginning, we had girls walking in the door. When they first started coming in, you told them they were pregnant. They would, cr they would cry, carry on. I'll never be able to tell my parents. My parents will kill us. I had one. She came in with her boyfriend mm -hmm. and two little children. They had just come from the bank, they said, and they had their money for the abortion. 
<laughs> and I wow. said, I think you're in the wrong place. But I said, maybe you're in the right place. <laughs> we had a long talk. And I think they changed their mind. And I don't know what they did with their money. I came home, told my husband. and So we would go visit her and take her things that she would need. And she, she said she didn't have an iron or an ironing board. <laughs> we took her one. And we took her some food and a bed for her baby. <coughs> I can't remember what all we did, but we, we would visit her. And while her husband was, or wasn't her husband, her boyfriend was in the service. So anyway, then she was getting along pretty good and we didn't go as much or as often. But then all of a sudden it was maybe about a year, maybe a little more, I don't know. Later, I got a, an invitation to their wedding. <laughs> They were going to get married. Oh, wow. Yeah, and she had her third baby. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Wow, so, what a success, right? Yeah, that was, that was one of the finer ones. The first time that I had to work and actually do a pregnancy test, we had to do a special kind that you had to rock it and everything. I, mean, I was so nervous. But one of my first clients called, and um, she was going to have an abortion, and it was a long story. Her husband left her and all that kind of thing, and she had no way to get there. I actually went down and got her way down in Lower Price Hill and brought her up, and we spent a whole lot of time together talking, and she just didn't know any other way out. But we, we kept in touch with her, and I gave her some things and helped her find a new place to live and so forth. But in the end, she named her little girl. Joey. And the funny, Rightfully thing, so. funny, <laughs> and funny part is later on uh, something happened and made the news and here I saw a picture of Joni in the newspaper. <laughs> I got to see her. So it, it was just you know sort of progressing and we knew that we had to begin to add the things that were missing out there in the community that were going to be spiritual and truthful and steadfast. So we began adding a much larger distribution area where the clients, we could take care of them, you know, with their needs. We, and Jeanette Allen was wonderful in that. It was like her calling. Jackie had a meeting, I think it was Our Lady of Lourdes, uh, when she was starting the center, and she just asked for volunteers, and my mom signed up, and she called her and asked her if she would start. I don't know why, she didn't know my mother. I was there at the meeting too, and I think I signed up, and my sisters, and it was just a, I think it was God's will yeah. <laughs> for the Blessed Mother. There were people at the center whose concern was outfitting a baby, outfitting a mother, and so forth. Uh, this was right up Jeanette's alley. She'd go through the clothes that were donated, she'd take them home, she'd wash them, she'd iron them, she'd hang them up, um, arrange them and so forth. She, um, her husband was driving her all over the place to pick things up and um, she just was completely devoted to seeing that our clients had the material resources that they needed to um, to sustain their pregnancy, you know, what to give them hope. I guess that's what Jeanette did. She was great at giving people hope. Were you involved in the moving from the new or old building to the new building? Um, not physically, but no. I was. I was. Yes. We did move to Prout's Corner, and the building was um, the space at Prout's Corner was donated to us by um, the Rellers and uh, they had some fond memories. That's where they met. There used to be dances at, at that place. There was a sign in this building for rent. So we thought, mm, okay, well, you know, the most we can do is ask and tell them that we were rent free before. It was Bill Reller. Bill liked what we were doing and he and Margie, uh, you know, um, had a meeting with me and said, we want to give you the entire building. So we said, okay. We finally were making some money, and we, I remember sitting there one time with a report at one of our board meetings, and uh, we said, hey, we got, I don't know, $100,000 or something. And we said, what do you think the Lord wants us to do with this? And we said, not sit on it. Let's go into the schools, and maybe we can prevent some of these clients from coming to our doors. And the in-control started. 
Uh, the Catholic uh, schools were very, very receptive. We had Donna Murphy out there doing these wonderful fetal development pieces and helping kids understand more about abortion. But we were just seeing so many clients come into the center and it was like, what can we do to put ourselves out of business? What can we do to get kids to change their lifestyle so they don't even need the services of the pregnancy center? And I was asked to um, consider starting a, a chastity program. At the time I worked in corporate America, I was a product manager. I feel like Peter, like God just pulled me out of one situation and put me into this. So what we do is we go into the schools and we explain to people that God has this wonderful plan for you. He's not here just to give you these rules to limit your life or limit your fun. He has a greater plan for you. One of the first times I spoke at Mercy, I spoke to a huge class during Flexi Day. And a girl came up to me afterwards, after I'd shown the beautiful pictures of baby development, after I had explained what abortion is and how abortion does hurt women, she came up to me afterwards and said her friend had just written her. She had moved to Texas and was planning on having an abortion. And so I gave her a lot of information that we have up at our center about baby development and what abortion is and the help that's available. And then I told her I would pray for her. And I prayed for her like every day and over time it became less and less. About a year later, I ran into her after mass and she said, oh, Mrs. Murphy, do you remember me from Mercy? And I said, oh yeah, I prayed for you for such a long time. And she said to me, well, I just became godmother of that baby. And that brought such joy to my heart. We're going into the schools, not so we can make a difference, but so that these students that we speak to, they can make a difference. One day that I'll never forget, I was over at Mercy High School in the old Spanish room where I was taught Spanish, and it was now a religion class. And after doing the program, one of the classes, the student stopped me and she said, I just want you to know that you have given me new life. I had been sexually active with my boyfriend. I had never heard of the term secondary virginity. I had no idea I could start over. I thought, I've gone down this path. This is my path for my life. And she said, today you guys empowered me to change. It's incredible. It's incredible. Girls fall in love with boys. Boys fall in love with John Cena. <laughs> it just became a community you know, of things where the schools were involved, the churches were involved, the community became involved. It just sort of progressed and progressed and progressed and we felt we needed a parenting class. So, you know, Kristen came on board. I spoke with Jackie who invited me to come in and talk about what, you know, what, what I was thinking. Um, I was really just wanting to get on board with a pro, you know, someone to help out in a program and um, that was not the plan, I think, for her or for God. <laughs> she challenged me to um, write a curriculum, which I was kind of taken back, like, okay, I'll do that. And so I did. I went home and I um, created the curriculum for the parenting class. It's a program that I know has grown and is uh, popular. And I think just the fact that it was a safe place for parents to come and, and just be loved on for a bit. I'm sure you got to develop some good relationships with some of the clients. Yes, I did get to I did develop a lot of relationships with the parents. Um, that was wonderful. That to me, I wanted to take them all home, and Jackie quickly reminded me that I couldn't do that. From there, that we just, you know, we began to grow, and you know, took the the victories, and you know, gave them to the Lord, and the losses, prayed about them, gave those to Him too, and in order to get back up and come back in again, you had to, you know, you you have to find a way. Yeah, you have to find a way. Jackie Carney retired um, after. But 30 years, 25 years, I don't know, um, being involved in the Pregnancy Center for and helping found it. Um, so I was honored to, to be the second. It was obvious from the outset that Jackie knew who her successor was going to be. And the board had a little bit different view that maybe we had to interview a few different people, which we did. But we ended up picking the one Jackie wanted. 
Rachel did an amazing job for five years as a presenter in our In Control program, and we were blessed to have her come on board as our executive director. With her youthful spirit and her new vision on things, we were able to start a whole lot of new programs, one of which was our Earn While You Learn program. Earn While You Learn is a program developed for pregnancy centers like ours um, to help the volunteers meaningfully engage with women who come for help with baby items um, to provide an educational component along with the material help. We had seen the uh, newsletter, a recent newsletter, and they were asking for Earn While You Learn uh, volunteers. Uh, that was about at the same time that we were looking for volunteer opportunities. And uh, so we made that connection at that point. Best decision we made. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is if you were one of these mothers or fathers you now involved as well, you would uh, uh, watch a video generally around a half an hour. While she watches the DVD, she'll fill out a questionnaire to help her engage with the information being presented. And the volunteer afterwards will have the opportunity to talk with her about what she's learned and pray with her and discuss other topics important in her life, give her baby bucks, which she can then choose to save up or spend, just like real money. This is our baby boutique, where the girls shop when they receive their baby bucks. Plenty of blankets. We have shoes that are free. We have onesies, bottles. Okay, just to keep it in mind. Things like that go for a little bit more. It's like I should put some more formula out. <laughs> There's a lot of people that we uh, deal with. Some of them just need a hug, and some of them need to just tell their whole story and pour out their emotions. And we sit there and listen to them and, and talk with them. And sometimes it affects us. We hope that uh, you know we are fulfilling their needs with those items, but our needs are quite fulfilled as well. Yeah. I remember one particular client who Lisa Smith served, who um, came in abortion-minded and at that time um, strung out on heroin. And it was a long road for her. There were um, a lot of downs before there were ups. And Lisa and Pregnancy Center West was there for her to help her initially get into rehab. But what I remember about her was that we got to see the result. Years later, um, she did participate in the Earn While You Learn program, which helped her with baby items, helped us keep that connection with her. And um, we got to meet her baby. And she shared in a newsletter how much we meant to her. What is it like to be an executive director at Pregnancy see. Center West? Um, When we were interviewing um, for new executive directors, one of the board members told an applicant that the executive director position was like being a Swiss Army knife. And that's how I would describe it too. To be our executive director requires so many skills. They have to be willing to meet with clients, whether they be abortion-minded or just clients that have all different kinds of needs. Um, they also oversee all of us client advocates and oversee fundraisers. So Rachel did a fantastic job for our five years and now we are blessed to welcome Nicole as our newest executive director. There's no like book that you can learn or training me that you get when you become an executive director. In this line of work, you might not consider fun to be an adjective you would use, but it is. It's fun to know that you can um, let God. It's, you can have that joy of working in a ministry where you really feel that you're doing something, but there's a joy in knowing that God is totally in control because I can see Him every single day. One of the programs that I was inspired by the Holy Spirit to start up here was the men's outreach program called the Be More Program. This is in part maybe an outreach to, to counsel these men on, on a more of an ongoing basis. I mean, in contrast to the pregnancy test where a woman comes in once and we may never see her again, the part with the men's uh, Be More program would be to hopefully maybe establish a sort of an ongoing uh, discussion and relationship um, with, with these men um, and try to assist them to be better husbands and be better fathers. We chose that the name of the program would be Be More. And this was a call to action that John Paul II gave to his to people that he would see. You know, you know, wherever you were at in your life, he would look at you and say, "Be more." It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what 
where you are spiritually, um, what economic level you come from, no matter where you are, it speaks to everybody. You just take another step because we're all called to be more. We're all called to, to be the best that we can be. Pregnancy Center West is called to be Christ in our community. So whether it's a man, a woman with her children, or an entire family that rings that doorbell and comes up those steps, we are there to serve them. We have an open heart, an open mind, and we're just constantly seeking direction as to where the next step needs to be. And we will always be present in this community as a force of good, promoting a pro-life, pro-family culture. What's kept you here for 17 years? I guess just believing in the mission. If my time can save one baby's life, then it's worth it. We are here for the same reason we were in 1980. We are presenting the truth. We are loving those girls, giving them alternatives to losing their babies, whether it be fostering, adoption, or you know, mothering their children. Right to Life a few years ago had a motto which I think is one of the best ones the pro-life movement has ever had and that's love them both. We can't um, love the mother to the exclusion of the baby, we can't love the baby to the exclusion of the mother. Both of them are human beings, both of them are created by God and we have to love them both. On a personal level, if somebody didn't understand until after they had an abortion, did you ever experience somebody who became came into full understanding of what that meant? Oh, after? oh sure, and repented, you mean? Yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. I helped with some weekends with people who've had abortions, and we had people crying and, and saying that they've been crying for a long time. I'm ch choking up. Yeah. I had a girl at the center and she wouldn't give up on her plans to have an abortion and she lives right here in, in, in this parish in Victory. Anyway, I couldn't get her to, I knew she was Catholic and everything and I said, you know what, I'm going to take my kids, we're going to go before the Blessed Sacrament and we're going to pray for you. And so I called her back that afternoon and I said, we were just up at church praying for you and she stopped and she said, okay, okay. <laughs> Each one of us is called to be a true Christian and stand up for life. Whether that means you're volunteering on the front lines, or whether that means you're praying on the front lines for us, or whether that means you are praying and donating as much as you can to help this mission move forward. Everybody has their, their calling in the movement. Looking back over my career, I would never have known that I would have had a 20-year stint at a pregnancy center, but obviously the Lord wants me here. I believe I do His work. He, I can see Him here every day. I see God at work in so many ways, I'm honored and privileged to be part of this. I think someone should consider volunteering at Pregnancy Center West if they want to make a difference to our culture. A lot of times we can feel helpless in our society, seeing all the bad things going on around us and seeing these big problems, but those big problems start in people's hearts, and this is a chance to influence and touch people's hearts. All you're doing is talking to people. You're talking to people that um, um, are looking for some help. And I think just trying to let them know that you're there to listen to what they have to say and uh, I think just being there for the person. You can really see that you're doing God's work. I mean, we're supposed to be evangelizing and we can do that as well as talking somebody out of the heaven. It's a beautiful way to serve God, to be His hands and heart in the world. And I've heard so many stories from people at the pregnancy center about things that God has done in their lives that I'm like, yeah. He's there. He works all the time. Being pro-life in our culture now is the voice crying in the wilderness. It's trying to keep the flame of God's love alive. The Holy Spirit is with us any way we, we go about this, but if, if we're proclaiming truth, then we can be sure we're on the right, right track. And certainly in the pro-life movement, there's a wonderful basic truth that we all belong to God's love and that every one of us is a reflected image of God's goodness and that's that's where we are
Hello friends, I'm Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life, and I want to thank and congratulate Pregnancy Center West, all its directors, team, staff, volunteers, and all of you, its friends and supporters, for 35 years of life-saving work. Hi, I'm Peggy Hartshorn from Heartbeat International. On behalf of all of the Pregnancy Help community, I wish you a wonderful 35th anniversary. God bless you for all the lives you've saved and changed and that will be impacted by your mission in the future. Hi, I'm Tom Glessner, president of the National Institute of Family and Life Advocates, known as NIFLA. We are a national network of 1,400 pregnancy centers across the country, of which the Pregnancy Center West in Cincinnati is a member. I just want to say happy birthday, happy anniversary. Thank you for the 35 wonderful years of serving women and saving babies. Uh, God bless you for your, all your work. This is Brad Mattis. I'm president of Life Issues Institute, and I'm so happy to congratulate Pregnancy Center West on their 35th anniversary. This is a big deal. This is 35 years of people giving their hearts, giving their resources, and giving their time to save babies, to protect them and their mothers. This is where the rubber meets the road. They have precious few minutes to talk to abortion-minded women, turn them around so that they make a choice for life and they're doing a marvelous job. Hello, I'm Janet Morana, Executive Director of Priests for Life. I also co-founded the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. And I want to congratulate Pregnancy Center West in Cincinnati, Ohio, after 35 years of assisting women who needed help, who were in unplanned pregnancies. I like to say it's an unexpected blessing, but you came alongside those women, gave them real help, real assistance and what they needed, whether it was housing or medical bills, whatever the need was, you were there because they had lost hope and that's why they consider abortion. So I want to congratulate you for standing up for women and babies and may God continue to bless the wonderful work you're doing. Hi, this is Sean Carney, the president of 40 Days for Life, wishing Pregnancy Center West a happy 35th anniversary. You are exactly one year older than I am. And congratulations on all of your work. May God continue to bless you and to strengthen you as we work and pray to end abortion in this country that we love so dearly. Hello, I'm evangelist Alveda King, the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the daughter of his brother, Reverend Alfred Daniel Williams King. They live in heaven now. I believe if they were here, they'd be smiling with me. Pregnancy Center West, you have 35 years of saving babies. What a remarkable and blessed track record. God bless you.